Hello, everybody. <laughs> this is another happy episode of Politicians Live. Uh, I'm sitting in for Rosemary Crawford for a few minutes so that I can let you all know about Mother's March for Peace. I, I, this, we're here to talk about politics, but uh, while we have a few minutes, I thought that I would just get in there for a minute and talk about the things that we need for our, how can I say, for our souls to breathe uh, in community. Started doing community work. That's why we're here right now. Uh, Mother's March for Peace came about as a result of all the chaos in our communities. Uh, we don't want to call it black on black crime. People have told me that that is not politically correct. So let me just say that there are things going on in our communities directed toward our people, our young people, old people, our men in particular, that we feel like we need to address. Um, having said that, uh, I have Lenny McAllister here with me. Ms. Terry, I, I started to call you Terry Bradshaw, Bradshaw earlier. I know, everyone does. <laughs> Don't laugh. Like Ms. Terry <laughs> Bradshaw here. And uh, these are the people who are the experts with reference to politics. Uh, I'm just getting involved. I think it's just a delightfully exciting world. And so we're going to go there just a little bit because I've been hearing people, people on top of people, say that they're not going to vote. They're going to sit this one out. They're not interested, and the last thing that I heard just today was, Jesus is my Lord and gets my vote, and I, I'm not putting that down. However, <laughs> what can we say, generally speaking, to people who are not feeling it, who feel let down by the system, who uh, were very uh, uncomfortable with what our present POTUS, beloved POTUS, is doing and has done. What, what can we say to them? That is the urgency of this show. Either one of y'all, we can start. Well, I, I think that what we have to let them know is that each vote matters, each election matters. And in 2016, I know at least with my race, we have an opportunity to have one of us represent us in Washington, D.C. for the first time in the history of the city of Pittsburgh. Okay. And to sit at home and to lose that opportunity and then look around our communities, whether it's here in the city of Pittsburgh mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. down in McKeesport or over in Wilkinsburg and say, well, we need more, we deserve more. Right. Well, you're not going to get that unless if you vote people in the office that are going to care about our communities, care about our kids, okay. care about our future, and bring jobs and opportunities back into areas that have been locked out of that for quite some time. What do, what do you think, Terry? What, what can we say to people? So, because part of the problem is that people, they don't understand the system. We don't understand don't. how to make it work for right. us. Correct. And, and looking at it from that perspective, I can see how somebody might, but with the people that we have running right now, it, to me it's a no-brainer, but to others they're saying no, neither one. Right. You know. So what, at well, the presidential level, right? That's at the presidential right, level. Right, but right. But even at the... Um, congressional level, it is important that we do vote because most of the things that happen to us have nothing to do with the president, okay? okay. It has to do with the, the Senate and the House, okay? okay? Those is where all the decisions are made and not that president that sits in that office. Mm -hmm. And we have seen what has happened these last eight years with them refusing to do anything. It's not because they couldn't. They had made a decision when he was getting sworn in right. that they were not, even if it was something they had once agreed on, they were going to say no. So okay. I think a lot of some people feel that well, why couldn't a president do something because I think there's a misunderstanding on his power right. and what he can do and what they he can't do. They don't understand the process. They don't understand they the don't process understand the that and those okay. seats are more important to us in actuality yeah. than that yeah. president for yeah. because that's what's going to change some of the the way the communities run and things like that and I think even just here in Pittsburgh yeah. um, we see some things the same old things going on the same people running everything for the last how long? And I think we need a new change okay. even here. Okay. But I think that misunderstanding of how politics works yeah. and runs is something that we've never taken the time to educate. Right. And we right. need to educate people on the process and what, if, what it affects right. in their lives. Because they're thinking, well, if I, whether I do or don't, it doesn't make a difference. But it really does make a difference. Um, just like you know, everything from the census determines how much your community is going to get money-wise. And a lot of people are afraid. Okay. So we need, to, right. we need to have classes right. that overcome those barriers to make right. them understand right. that their vote is a force of power yeah. that is power for them we, we because they really, think they don't have money but money yeah. is a sense of yeah. course it's power but your vote has a lot of power your, and your vote dictates where the money goes I exactly. mean the bottom line is the House of Representatives we're voting on okay. who's gonna get what appropriations 
we're voting on what's going to where in regards to the budget. The, the president can veto that budget, okay. but that's happening in the 435 people that are allocating that. They're t determining who's going to get grants. Mm -hmm. We're determining what the tax rate's going to be, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who's going to be able to invest where. You know, will people right. that have had a good year economically be able to reinvest in communities or start new businesses or hire more people? Okay. All of those decisions are happening in the House of Representatives. Let me tell you what I think, and, and this is just playing devil's advocate with it. I vote myself and I have not really understood the process myself. All of the nuances, all the steps that lead up to what, right. who does what, as far as you know, what, poli what, what does District. a congressman do? Mm -hmm. right. What does a senator do? What does a state representative? I think that's what we don't understand. And not having that information is where we are right now in looking for solutions. We're looking for resolutions. We got some serious problems in some of our communities. So it's like no matter who's in office, these are these problems are going to, they've been there. They've and, they've been been, there. And, and unfortunately, a lot of times what you end up seeing are the same old people, like Terry said, <laughs> the same old people running for office telling you, I'll fix it this time around, I'll fix it this time around, I'll give you a little bit more money, and I'll fix it this time around. And if something goes awry, it must be the other guy's fault. If it's the Republicans, it must be the Democrats' fault. Here's if it's the Democrats, it's the Republicans' be. fault. The truth of the matter is, if you don't have leaders that we elect, in these elections, you only have finger pointers, not leaders that are trying to resolve things. And in the meanwhile, as you well know, yes. people in our community, they suffer, they die, whether oh it's a gosh. violent death oh or it's a, a long-term death where we're having bad health care, right. bad education, Absolutely. no employment, and then right. subsequently we suffer. So we have to start electing leaders into mm -hmm. these positions, not incumbents, that are doing the same old, same old, giving us the same old results. Well, well let's talk agree. about though. I would agree. We do need. but. What? But but those leaders aren't coming to our communities. I don't know those leaders. But I don't know they, those. You've met one tonight. I yeah. have. I have <laughs> met before. <laughs> but I mean, you have to come out and say, "I'm here. This is what I'm going to do different." Because nobody comes to our communities. I mean, you might see them. They might stand at the busway or okay. do some things like okay. that. But okay. there's nobody saying when Penn Hills had this horrible thing with the school. I didn't see no politicians saying, "Absolutely not." Okay. What happened okay. here? But we, you know, we, Terry, we lost. What, we what, lost a lot what, of teachers, but nobody is screaming about that. But what is the responsibility of the community? Because we're we're looking to our leaders to solve our problems and say, okay, but we you're elect elected leader. now. Right. I voted for you. Handle it. You know that is not the way that it gets done, and I think that's where we we make our. Well, I think safe. I think we need to partner up, but they don't always partner up with us. Okay, so they get elected and we never see them again. Okay, I think what what we do wrong is we don't hold them accountable. Yeah. They, okay. they, yeah. they 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 just get our vote. We don't ask them for anything. We just give it to them. Okay. Um, and we, we wonder why them. nothing is going on. Well, first of all, you didn't ask for anything, nor do you hold me accountable. We we, you're right. We have problem. to do better as communities saying, yeah. okay, you got, you got it. Even this next one, whether it's May or whatever, okay, we, we need to make sure we're finding out what's going to be done different. How does it benefit us? I mean, Pittsburgh was picked again as the best city. Unemployment for African Americans is 23%. How does it get picked as the best city? It left that number out. The best and city? Where are they getting these statistics? I heard something saying that we were quite one of the worst. Well, I just heard worse, that recently. We have, we have two communities that are on the Forbes list as the worst communities in I the see. United States. I see. Worse than Baltimore and Chicago is right here. Two cities in Pittsburgh are in the top ten. Nobody's addressing that. And Nobody's get, saying and Terry, get, Well, I'm addressing that. I'll tell you right where they're located right now. I can tell you they're oh, located. You can tell in me the where they are? They're located in the 14th Congressional District. Okay. They, they are the same communities that we have seen for quite some time. There, there are your Braddocks. There are your McKeesports. There are your Rankins. Communities that have been forgotten for quite some time, where people have not been able to bring in business investment, mm -hmm. reinvest in the community, hire people. There are where hospitals have been closed down, such as what you've seen in Braddock. When you start looking at what the communities have to be able to do moving forward, okay. particularly in my race, we're looking for partnerships. I'm looking to be elected. I'm looking to break history as the first African-American congressman in the history of the city of Pittsburgh. Okay. But at the same exact wow. time, partner and be able to say each step of the way, we're going to have a relationship. And a lot of times, Politicians don't understand relationships. They understand how to get votes. Mm -hmm. right. They know how to get reelected, but they do not how understand how to foster relationships okay. because relationship means that you're going to criticize me. You may criticize me right. in a very upset and angry way, but if we love each other, if we're in this partnership together as a servant leader and as a community, we can work through the tensions Absolutely. and get results. Absolutely. We don't see that anymore in you government. Don't. That's what I'm looking to bring, and that's what we need more of starting in 2016. Okay. And, and this sounds good. One of the things that I like about our police chief here in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. is that he seems to embody that. Uh, he is about community. He comes, and I, I got a 
you know, honk as a toot his horn every, every chance I get because he's, um, he's somebody who is not afraid to stand up and say that we need to we do. commit ourselves to helping the community. I think he's a good he police chief, that. but he had yeah. a lot of pressure too. You understand, we're, not, we're one of the cities that the government picked as one of the worst police departments when they wanted to bring out this new program. Pittsburgh was one of them. Okay. Okay, so we've had some issues going on here, but I think part of it is a community that based, like that relationship right, has right. not been there because it's right. the same powers be. We have not fought enough. We have not demanded enough. Right. And, and so we have to get rid, rid of the mentality of thinking somebody owes us something and we don't have to work. We really need to go after and, and make demands and, and make sure that they're accountable as I think what yeah. we do. He, as you're saying, you're running, the problem with our elections is this. Those people who don't understand, they don't know how to split a ticket, okay? That's right. going, okay? They is don't know how to vote right. this way for some of these right. and these. Right. They're just not. They're going to hit it one time, straight down. That's a right. problem we it have is. because right. they don't know right. how. Right. And, but that goes back to, I mean, number one, and I think what to, we're seeing in our race is, that goes back to the politician. You have to forge a relationship so that people know where to find you on the ballot, people know where to find your office, people need to be able to find get your legislation, your get, get in, in your office, office <laughs> get on your schedule, have the town hall meetings, the right. forms, the copies, et cetera, to say, listen, it's February, right. let's talk about what's happened over the first 30 days, over the first 90 Absol days, over the first six Absolutely. months, so that there's progress, there are milestones, but it goes back to your point, Terry, we have to know how to vote as well. Doesn't mean that you have to vote all Republican or all Democrat, right. Right. but it's just like when you go to a uh, Golden Corral, right? Okay. You don't always go and get every single food in a buffet now, right. do you? You right. get your favorites. You get the stuff that's good for you and tastes good. Okay. And you're paying the same price, but you know what? Everybody's coming back with a different meal, but everybody's satisfied. And if we learn how to vote like that, that's particularly this but, year, but, okay. I think we'll get better results. And I think we, might we, be, we might actually be satisfied like, like most people are at we Golden Corral. But that, that issue is a huge issue okay. because many people will say, I'll go vote they have no idea, they know how to vote straight, yes. whatever it is. Okay. They don't okay. know how to break up that vote to say, okay, I may vote for these people, but I really like you, okay. so I'm gonna go that way. And okay. I think the hardest part you possibly have is who's running for president, okay? okay. It, okay. It's gonna make it real hard for anybody. There's no trust there. True. Alrighty, alrighty. There's no trust. We're gonna, we're, we're gonna, we're Which gonna. Which is making it tough. But, but we don't, we, we really need to understand But we really need to listen, we really need to listen to period. all sides. We need to not say, I don't want to hear okay. because he's a Republican. Because uh -huh. we, we hadn't even brought, had we even brought that up. We hadn't well, even we brought that up. Yet. Well, yeah, we, I know we do, I know we do. We have and, to. And on that because happy note, we're going to get a little <laughs> bit deeper into politics. Yeah. We're going to bring Rosemary on. She is the one. I, I'm a political novice, you all. <laughs> I have to tell you that. My name is Flo Taylor, though, and I'm one of the people who represents Mother's March for Peace. Have to get that out there because that is what we do. We are going to get in. We're going to work with the politicians. We're going to work with the police chiefs and police all over the country, and we're going to get something done this year. But we're going to take a break right now. Rosemary will come back and get okay. with the experts and I'll disappear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As election day approaches, voters will receive dozens of political mailers. While some ads will be in support of a particular candidate, many will simply sling mud. Negative political ads hurt democracy. They cause voters to give up on finding a good candidate. Great. Great. And these are our candidates. They encourage emotional rather than reason voting. I'd vote for anyone but that jerk. And they discourage qualified candidates from even running. Me? Are you kidding with all this negative advertising? What can you do? Seek out nonpartisan information such as smartvoter.org. Be wary of attack ads, scare tactics, and innuendo. Consider who's paying for the ad where they're from, and who benefits. Be a smart voter. Don't be duped by negative ads.
Hi, and welcome back to The Politicians Live with our guest, Terry Bradford and congressional candidate, Lenny McAllister. I was so enthralled by the first segment. You guys are amazing, so let's get right back into it. Uh, I do want to get a little background information though on you, uh, Lenny. Tell us, and you're running for Congress, and just to be clear, United States Congress, yes. not state. And, uh, and I heard you guys talking a little bit that there's sometimes there's a little confusion about the yes. different offices. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us, um, in the United States, you would actually be working in Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C., yes. Absolutely. So can you tell, well, we have a call already. Um, mm -hmm. I'll take the call. Caller? Hello? Hi. Um, I'm really concerned. Uh, I feel that Donald Trump is a real danger to our society. And I've never been more concerned about the future of our country than I am now. I, given all of that, I strongly believe that Secretary Clinton is the only sane choice to have in this election. And I'd be really interested in your thoughts as well. Uh, thank you, caller. It was a little bit uh, garbled, your call. But I believe the essential part of that is there's fear of this election. Um, that Donald Trump may be the next uh, president of the United States of America. And I've heard some people question his qualifications. So, and we're kind of going to talk about your qualifications, but let's just answer this question. Do you believe that Donald Trump, both of you, is qualified to be president of the United States of America? And let's hear it. I think that Donald Trump has won the nomination for the Republican Party. I think that, you know, every time you go into an election, there are people that will doubt qualifications. And I think that people probably would not doubt them as much if Mr. Trump didn't say as many inflammatory things as he has said. Mm -hmm. um, I know that President Obama went in there with only two years of senatorial experience before he ran for the presidency. And no sooner than he went in there, within two years, Osama bin Laden was taken off the battlefield. So, I mean, there are things that you can say that people with, quote, unquote, less experience are able to get things done. The problem with this race is the fact that you have one person that continuously says inflammatory things and one person that continuously, you know, basically shoots herself in the foot. So you have two candidates that are not exactly very popular. You have one candidate that called our black youth super predators that need to be brought to heel as if they were dogs, and then we wonder why our kids have been shot in the street like dogs over the last 20 years. And then you have Donald Trump on the other side saying the things that he has said. Mm -hmm. So you may have one person that has more government experience, but you don't have a candidate at the presidential level that people feel confident getting behind over the course of the next four years, which makes down ballot races that much more important. Yeah. To find leaders there that people can trust, can like, can bridge gaps across both sides of the aisle <clears throat> and be able to bring a different type of tone to government. Okay, Ms. Bradford? I think my opinion is there is that confusion on both. People mm -hmm. fear fear of both, but one person has been in politics for 40 years. Easy to pick at things that she once did because for 40 years she's been there. So you That's can true. go way back, you've got things. This person over here was in business, right? We know his father would not allow African Americans to even live in his apartment buildings way back then. We know what he does to unions when he doesn't pay them and makes them sue, and then they go run out of business because they can't sue him for long enough. We already know of the things, too, that he has done, but I don't know of the things he has done to help people. Uh, we know that uh, CHIP uh, was started by Hillary Clinton. I don't know what Donald Trump has done or started in this country that has been helpful besides himself. It's been all about him, and I don't know, I understand why people would fear that it's never about us, it's about him, and he has made sure you understood that. So I understand the confusion on one has lied, both has lied, but I don't think there's a comparison on who's more qualified. I mean, that's whether you like her or not is, is totally different than whether she's qualified. So I think that has caused some of this this back and forth of who has shown to be presidential. He has done nothing to make us feel safe. Let's go back to Chip, just for our viewers, because we do try to educate the community. What is Chip? Uh, essentially. Essentially, yeah. It's a, it's child, a child, child health, health insurance, insurance program. program that Hillary Clinton started more than 20 years ago, because uh, she has been adamant since she was 18 at trying to make sure that underprivileged children and women have been taken care of. So when we came up with this, when Chip started, a lot of people didn't know mm -hmm. she started that. She doesn't go around bragging every day that she's done that, but that's not, that's just one of the things she has done. If you're a parent, single mom, you're looking for that person who shows some empathy, some sympathy. I don't, I haven't heard that in anything Donald Trump, even if I want to be objective, every time it seems he opens his mouth, 
there's something coming out. So and so essentially, CHIP provides insurance. It for provides insurance for, for children. For right for okay. children with low income children, um, so that they're covered from everything from health care, their teeth, dentistry, if they need braces, all those things have been covered. So. When she started that one 20 years ago, it wasn't because she was trying to run for president. It was bef long before she was in that, but it was a person who has compassion. Mm -hmm. We need compassion because we're all at different levels. So we but, need but you got to admit, she's been running for president for quite some time. She, she knew, I mean, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing right. to have presidential aspirations, but this oh, is sure. somebody that was telling folks in 1992, you're going to get a two for one if you elect Bill Clinton. So she is somebody that has had her eye on the presidency. Back for in 1998, I did say right. that I'm going to win our Well, he meant, I'm, well, I'm not, well, say, well, I'm not I, saying, hey, I'm not like, trying to I say like one versus the other. Before, that's why I wanted you both on here, but I do want to actually sure. host the show and then bring up, uh, go, go through something that I've sure. heard in the community. A lot of people are Sanders or Bust. Now these are yeah. for the Democrats. Absolutely. And so would this reply be for toward Ms. Bradford? Yes. So for those people, who are looking at the 90s actually, sure. and kind of to follow up on what you said, sure. um, and they're and looking at the programs, the mandatory minimums that were essentially started in the Clinton administration, and then also looking at NAFTA and a lot of jobs went out overseas. So they're concerned about um, the mass incarceration of African Americans that occurred during the Clinton administration. So what do you say to those people? Sure. First of all, the mass incarceration was Bill Clinton. It was not Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Two different people. That was her husband. She is running for president. So that two for one is not really <laughs> It's not true. because okay. she's not she's not running with him. Mm -hmm. But she's and the one not. that did say the super predators that need to be brought to heel when they were trying to get the school to prison pipeline started to be sure. established. She, she she made that I statement. I would agree with that. She, and she supported that legislation. Okay, she so did. She, I mean, and you, there was a lot of a lot of Republicans that reported that, right? Well, a lot of people did. A lot of black caucus went for that too. Yeah, they so did. we need to understand that it wasn't just Hillary. No, there I'm, was, not, I'm not just trying to put it on her. There's a lot of black caucus that actually and went for that. And just to let Ms. Bradford too. finish this. So I think, um, you know, there's always that confusion. And I understand the Bernie issue, mm -hmm. right? Because they're, you know, and they, they want And what do you it. say to those people? She's not Bill, okay, what but, else? Okay. What is she going to bring to the table? Because well, some of them the want to sit out is, the election. What, what, if she doesn't win, what is he bringing to you? Far worse than what? What, where you are now, you're going to go that far back from all the things you want. He's not giving you no $15. He's not even trying. He's already told you what he's not going to do. So not voting is not hurting her. You're, you're helping him. And the question you have to ask yourself is, are you okay with him winning? And if you are, then that's fine if you don't vote. Are you okay? Are you going to tell your family, your kids, your grandparents, I didn't vote, so that's why he's in? If you're okay, if you can consciously say that to yourself, knowing what he's going to do, because he has not made a bone about it. He has told you exactly. So he hasn't made up. He hasn't fooled us. So if that's okay, then these people have to just accept that. But I think they need to look at the total picture. Nobody gets the perfect president. There is nobody that's going to do everything. Um, but you're looking at somebody that at least is interested in your well-being. Now, I want to. One of you mentioned the Congressional Black Caucus. So, uh, Mr. McAllister, can you explain a little bit? Because the CBC weekend is coming up. The it Congressional is. Black Caucus yes, weekend is. is coming up in September. It's something I've attended. It's very uh, informative. Um, not exactly the splendor used to be, but it's still exactly. decent. But can you tell us a little bit about the Congressional Black Caucus? Because if you win this election, you would be part of that organization exactly. and what that can bring to the table in terms of the impact on society. I think that, you know, and there have been some black Republicans that have chosen not to join the Congressional Black Caucus. I would not be one of those. Mm -hmm. I think that it's highly important to be a member of the Congressional Black Caucus and have it be a true bipartisan or dare I say nonpartisan organization, something that can look at um, African American issues that we're facing and, and bring a level of, of weight, gravitas, and bipartisanship to really go after some of these issues. I'm actually looking to do the same exact thing here. If, should I win in November, I plan on forming a coalition with Ed Ganey and, and Jake Wheatley and, and Mr. Walton and, and the two gentlemen on the city council so that there can be a, a level of conversation that's never been able to be had before. Because, I mean, right. generally speaking, the five of them are Democrats. They chirp too loud. They, they get in trouble with the Democratic Party. If I am the next congressman here and we all, as a united front, say something, now we are not talking as Democrats. We are talking as African Americans from this region that have concerns that have not been addressed for 40 to 50 years. So whether it's me belonging to the CBC or working in a partnership with the five elected officials that we currently have, I plan on working there so that 
we can bring these issues to the table once and for all. We can talk about the e economic disparities. We can talk about the education disparities, mm -hmm. the employment disparities. We can talk about the over-incarceration of African-American men, which is less about the police and more yes. about the DAs it's and the people writing the yeah, laws. Yeah, right, right. So we need to start going after these issues, even gun violence. Gun violence is oftentimes an economic issue. If you Absolutely. don't have jobs and you don't have good schools and you don't have opportunities, then the only thing you're going to pretty much go to are drugs and the underground economy, which is going to involve a gun. Absolutely. We have to start talking about those issues and going after them in a very strong fashion. I look forward to doing that both here locally with the five here as well as in the CBC starting in January. Let's talk about, as a Republican, um, some of the issues that you have just kind of uh, mentioned. Um, how would you handle them? Let's talk about gun violence. You know, pretty much the platform of the Republican Party is hmm. pro-NRA, pro-guns. And pretty, and essentially, in the Democratic Party, is more so gun control. What's your position? Pro legal guns, and there's a big difference. We continue to write gun laws that take guns out of the hands of law-abiding citizens, and when it comes to the illegal guns. We're not addressing that the same way. When you can have a kid that gets busted with a gun, they go down to the DA's office, and they can plead down the gun charge, go right back out on the streets, and shoot and kill somebody, that's not the gun law, that's the DA. That's the law and how it's written. That has to be adjudicated differently. Now, with that said, I've already said that when it comes to gun violence, a lot of this is an economic issue. Mm -hmm. If you start rebuilding the community, you start rebuilding the family. You start rebuilding the family, you start having more structure. People aren't walking out your door at 10 and 11 years old at 11 and 12 at night. That's when all the trouble brews up anyway. When you start looking at being able to have jobs and more home ownership, you can start having more community centers. You can have more community stability. That's when you start having more YMCAs. That's when you start having more after school programs. That's when you have more built-in mentors. While at the same exact time building up the schools. Because again, we all well know that the revenue for the local schools comes from home ownership. So if people have jobs, there's more money to put into the local community. It brings up the quality of the schools. A lot of the gun violence has to start there. Now, does that mean that we don't enforce the laws that are on the books? Absolutely. If you have a 19-year-old that gets caught with an AK-47, Something has to be done with that, right. obviously, but you can't allow him to go from a five-year sentence to a five-month sentence knowing full well he's going to go right back on the street, go find that gun or a bigger gun and cause some problems. Now, Ms. Bradford, what are your thoughts on that? My answer is get rid of it. What, what do we need AK-47 legally anyway in this country? What, who, are we going to war? That's the only time you need an AK-47 if you got on a uniform and you're over in another country. They need to go. We let have, ask, let me we have no this. justification. Well, I want to let her finish. Yeah, we don't ahead, have I'm any sorry. justification for AK-4. In the state of Pennsylvania, we got a loophole in our law okay, what that says mean? you can buy a gun over the computer. You can buy it without no background check. We refuse. Our legislator, basically Republicans, will not bring it down for a vote. When we do have the votes, we have the votes. The people want it, but they won't bring it to the floor because they don't want to do that. So. I don't, if the, if the people want it, I thought these people represented us. And if, if 80% of this state says, what's the difference? Every, everybody, everybody else got to go through a check. Why do private owners not have to? I don't know how we're fighting over this in the state of Pennsylvania. So why can't we just close that loophole? Why can't they just vote on that? I don't understand why we're fighting over something that the people of the state of Pennsylvania wants. Okay, I'm going to change up a little bit because you know we have an hour show mm -hmm. and a lot of things I want to talk <laughs> yeah. about. Minimum wage, because money came up. You, uh, Mr. McAllister, you just talked about the fact that you need to have good jobs and things like that. And Republican Party, essentially, I don't know that they're for minimum wage. Um, so Donald what's your Trump position on that? Too high. John Trump says you're making too well, much. Well, he said that, and at the same exact time, he said he wanted to put it up to $10 an hour, too. So he's, the problem with Donald Trump is that he said both things, <laughs> yes, right. and he does that an awful lot. He will say <laughs> one thing and then say the other thing, Absolutely. and so there's no consistency yeah. there. And what so, do you say, Mr. McCallister? Well, what I say is that we should increase the minimum wage. Do I think that it should go up to $15 no. an hour? No. And the reason why <laughs> I, I'm fearful of it going up to $15 an hour yeah. is because I do not want it to eliminate $10. the opportunities for young people to get those jobs. Those jobs are the gateways into getting better jobs. We want to be able to raise the minimum wage, but at the same exact time, allow people to be able to get career jobs, not just these minimum wage jobs where they're stuck there for 10 years. So you have to have an economy where people can get the entry level jobs, but then from there there's job growth in a way that's a lot better than what we've seen. We're seeing one and a one and a half percent GDP growth for the last several years. We're supposed to be at three to four percent 
on a quarterly basis. We need to get that back up oh. so that people get the minimum wage jobs, but then they can get the tertiary jobs, and then they can get the managerial jobs, and then they can go own a business and really prosper. Wow. Okay, Ms. Braff, I, I would agree. I don't think, um, first of all, every community can't handle $15 an hour because you'll knock businesses out. They just can't afford small businesses may not be able to pay. So then maybe so, there should be right, some Right, so some areas, employee. like maybe big New York can afford that, mm -hmm. but some small rural area can't, can't do mm -hmm. 15. So we have to look at that whole picture. But I do believe it needs to go up, absolutely. Um, even in a city like Pittsburgh where 23% um, unemployment, we have 23,000 jobs right now in Pittsburgh open, yet we have an unemployment rate of 23% for African American males. Um, I notice here that mm -hmm. Uh, my son works at Westinghouse in Cranberry, the only African-American in IT. They had 15 openings and they didn't pick any. So even if you have the jobs, the question is, are we getting in? Who's going to make sure that the gatekeeper is going to make sure that they're still allowing us these jobs, even though we're qualified? That's why we're losing so many young people, because they go to college, they do the right things, they do everything they were supposed to do, but still can't get that job. Great point. We do have a caller. Caller, you're on the air. What's your question or comment? Uh, yes. My name is Audrey, and I'd like to talk about this voting issue that um, young people aren't feeling that it's necessary to vote. I am in total disagreement with that. And have you done anything special to enhance the attitude of making people vote and understand the importance of voting? Um, I've been watching some things here and paying attention to some of the issues of trying to stop voter fraud, which I never knew was a problem, but it's an issue that really addresses the black neighborhood. You know, um, trying to enforce a non-voting because, you know, you don't have ideas like that seems to be, you know, not working. I don't understand. Oh, it I think it's garbled. People yeah. afraid to vote or making them think that it's not a good thing to vote. Thank you, Carla. You're a little bit garbled, so we're going to end this call. But I would kind of bring, you did address some very good issues. One, million dollar question, how do you get people to vote? I mean, yes. that is a million dollar question. And I do want to say, and you hit on this earlier in the first segment, uh, Ms. Bradford, that when some politicians who care more, when some politicians are looking at resources for a community, they look at the percentage of voter turnout. Oh, absolutely. And they, absolutely. you know, and, and they say, well, this board or district, they vote. So we're going to give Take them care. resources. Absolutely. And the communities where people vote the least, the communities that need to help the most, a lot of times those are the communities where they have the least resources. And I would say to people, if you really are not satisfied with any of the people running, just vote for yourself, because at least you would have voted, and that'll bring up the stats. But, but, but go ahead. more on top of that, what we have to explain to people is this, that you can't let them take your vote for granted. They also look at the numbers, and they say very simply that, well, they're going to vote for me regardless of what I do. Right. They're going to give me their vote whether I give them a million dollar grant or I give them a ten thousand dollar grant. So you have to be able to hold them accountable and say you will get my vote if you build up my community. Right. If you're not willing to build That's up right. my community and be accountable, you won't vote. get my vote. I don't care who you are. Now and here, and, and I will follow with you later Ms. Bradford, but I kind of want to touch on something uh, with uh, Mr. McAllister. Is that in part impact why you are in a Republican as opposed to a Democrat? Do you think that there should be representation on both sides of the aisle? Do you think there's value to that? I, I think that I fit in regards to the principles of the Republican Party. I think that a lot of the extolled values verbally that the Republican Party has brought about, especially over the last 10 years, is very drastically down the wrong path. Mm. And it needs to be recalibrated. I think that for the disadvantaged, there needs to be voices on both sides of the aisle people that can be consistent with their political philosophy, but at the same exact time, be able to advocate for people across a diversity, including here, for example, in the city of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Can you represent people that are well-to-do in Point Breeze just as much as you represent people that are struggling in Homewood or struggling in, in Lincoln Larmer? You know, I grew up in Penn Hills. Penn Hills has a mm -hmm. diversity of people there economically. Can you represent all of them equally? And I think that for us as African Americans, for us as Pittsburghers in the, 26th century, um, in the 21st century in 2016, if you're able to be able to represent across that diversity, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, in my instance as a Republican, 
people can get the benefit of bipartisanship in a way that we just don't see anymore. That's what statesmanship is all about, the ability to work with both sides of the aisle, love everybody as Americans, and get results in an ongoing, consistent fashion. And for, uh, we have another caller, but I do want to just, um, and then I'll get you, Ms. Bradford, yeah. um, bipartisanship. Some of our, we educate on this show, some of our, uh, vo our, our audience don't know what bipartisanship Absolutely. means. What does that mean, Ms. Bradford? Can you define it for us? Bipartisanship means if you're, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you're across the aisle, you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, we can work together. We work together. We work together. Work together. Synergy. We may have two different ideals, but we come together as one for the betterment of our people, and that's what we really need. But my is question- Is that gonna happen? The, qu the question is happening is, will we make them? Will we right. make it happen? We have to be, get more involved right. in what's going on and picking up the phone and calling your congressmen and, and your senators. We have to do all that. But my yeah. hard question for you is, Republicans stick together very closely. They, they yes, rarely they jump the fence and go to the other side. Democrats do that quite a bit, but Republicans usually don't. We know how your House and Senate feels. For you to be up there, mm -hmm. in there, mm -hmm. how are you going to get them? So let me, let, me, let me explain that very quickly. When the Republicans try to pass the voter rights oh. or the voter ID law. Sorry, in, caller. The voter okay. ID law in, in, in 2012, I was the only black Republican nationally to stand with the NAACP and others to strike down that voter rights law. When it came to things such as stop and frisk, which is a violation of the Fourth Amendment that our young black men go through on a regular right. basis, I am the only black Republican pretty much nationally that is looking to strike down stop and frisk policies, both here in the city of Pittsburgh, where I, I, I took on Cameron McLeod face to face, mm -hmm. and although I like him personally, that is a, that is a policy here in the city of Pittsburgh yes, that's unconstitutional. Yes, so is. when you start talking about taking a stance, I have marched with the civil rights icons of this time, I've marched with Jesse Jackson, I've marched with Al Sharpton, I've marched with Ben Jealous. I have no problem being a Republican that understands civil rights because I'm an Elsie Hillman Republican, I'm a Jackie Robinson Republican, I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican, and that okay. means that when it comes to racism, I'm going to have to stand aside from whatever Republican wants to use racism and call okay. it rhetoric. Okay. 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 Now, okay. I do want to go back a little bit. Thank you, caller. Um, we can get, I think we may have another caller. Can we release okay. this caller? Thank you. But um, I did want to, I, I still want to go back because we still <laughs> want to educate and just to say some people still may not understand actually the chart, like the organizational chart. So we have the President of the United States and the President of the United States actually is executive, uh, decision maker, he carries out the laws, things of that nature. And then we have the Congress, which includes the Senate no, and the House, the House of Representatives. Yes. And that is what you're, you're now mm -hmm. there's, each state has two senators and then the number of actual House of Representatives it's contingent on the amount of people in, uh, in the in state. the in the state. Right. Uh, so um, I wanted to know what is it? What makes you the best candidate in your particular race? The ability to be able to talk across the diversity of this region, to be able to connect with each pocket of the 14th congressional district, to understand what it's like to be inside the political system and outside the political system. My opponent has been involved in establishment style politics for four decades has never had a job outside of this since his 20s. To be able to say, I've been through the Great Recession with you, I have been through unemployment, I have been through dropping out of school, I have gone back to school, I know what it's like to go through gun violence. My dad was shot and almost killed 20 years ago. My wife is a survivor of gun violence. I'm a survivor of gun violence. To be able to talk about the different experiences, to be able to work with different types of people and have mutual respect across the aisle, be able to get things done, strike down the wrong type of laws and uplift the right type of laws, and be able to talk about prosperity and move away from what we've been seeing over the decades, that's inspiring hope and that's inspiring leadership versus the status, same old, same old that we have seen for decades now. Now we have two callers. Uh, first caller, you're on the air. What's your question or comment? Hello, um, this is, I'm calling for Lenny. Uh, I am a Republican and I support Lenny. But I Thank need you. to clarify something. Were you just saying that there are, I mean, there's racism everywhere, but were you placing it in the Republican Party? Because personally, that's why I left the Democrat Party. I'm married to a black man, have biracial children. And when you see that the black uh, people are being slaughtered, genocide, 25% of all abortions uh, in the black community, when the black race is 13%, of our population, that's genocide, and it's the Democrats that support that policy. Wow. 
No, and, and, and what I'm saying is that you find it. I'm saying when you see Republicans, and first of all, call, I appreciate you calling, I appreciate your support. What I'm saying is that when there have been instances where there has been racism that I've seen from the conservative side, I, I stand up to that. Just as much as I've stood up to the racism on the liberal side or on the left, it, it's about, it's less about politics when you start talking about racism. It's about either you're American and you're patriotic and you love America as it is in the, its fullness of its diversity, or you don't. Because if you don't love that richness, if you are a racist, whether you're a D or an R, you're basically saying, I want a weakened America. I want to take away from the talents. It would be just like saying, I don't like women. Well, you're talking about half of your workforce, Absolutely. half of your attorneys, half of your business executives, half of your parents. Are you trying to tell me that you don't want to be the strongest America possible? So no, when I say racism from the Republican side, I'm saying, if I find it there, I stand against it there. If I see it on the Democratic Good. side, I stand against it there as well. Uh, Ms. Right. Graff, are your right. comments on that? Sure, um, and, I, and I understand what she is saying. Um, unfortunately, um, when you talk about 25% of people having abortions are African Americans. These are the people that are through Planned Parenthood that they have to keep on record. Those that go to their private doctors, you don't know about. So you, you can't honestly say that's a correct number. Um, I think the thing with the Democrats are saying a woman should have a choice not uh, somebody else uh, deciding on a woman's body what she should or shouldn't do. Um, so I think I, I, I understand what you're saying um, and asking his question about racism because it's terrible any, in, in any type of way. Mm -hmm. But I think. But do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, Carla. I do. I do understand yes. what you're saying. But I think yeah. the, the choice. Well, we're of, killing. We're killing right. more black babies than are being born. Thank That's you, genocide. Thank you, caller. No. And okay, uh, we you. do have another call, and we did ask that question. I would like to go to the next caller. Caller, you're on the air. Hello, this is Jackie Hill. How are? How's everyone? Hey, Hi, how are you? How are you? <laughs> we know Jackie Hill. How are you? Um, one of the things that the issues I'd like to raise is the we've forgotten something, and that is the community-based um, committee structure that has pretty much bec um, become very weakened in black communities across the city. If you ask the average person in a neighborhood or community who their committee person is, they probably would not know. And they play a valuable role if used properly. They are the ones who get out and knock on doors, educate people, get people to the polls. Mm -hmm. And unless we go back to focusing on that structure, those are people that we know and that we can hold accountable. They are also the people who determine who are going to be on the Democratic slate. I think that's a very relevant call uh, and very relevant comment. Um, and that whole committee structure is mm. something that there are pros and cons about. But because we have a limited time today, I'm going to go to the next caller uh, because I do want to kind of talk more about the, yes. uh, pre the, the, the the national elections. Caller, you're on the air, but thank you, Jackie. Bye. Caller. Hello. Yes. Hi. Oh, hi. Listen, I I am a member of Mothers March for Peace. And I'm also a resident of downtown Pittsburgh. And I'd like to address the issue with the violence that's been happening downtown mm -hmm. after every event that we've had, the uh, 4th of July shooting, we got uh, stuff. It is. And, and do you think it's supposed to be done like this? Something like that? To curb the evil? Caller, you're not very clear, so we're going to end this call, but I think I did get a little yeah. bit of information. There's the issue of violence downtown and, a, and, and whether or not we should have a curfew. But thank you, caller. Uh, we can end that call because it was too unclear. But uh, we can go with you, Mr. McAllister. What's your thoughts on the violence downtown Pittsburgh and whether or not there should be a curfew? I mean, does it really matter if somebody gets shot at 8 o'clock at night or at 1 o'clock in the morning? Mm -hmm. I mean, the bottom line is if you're not going after the, the rudimentary issues, of what's causing the violence. It doesn't matter if somebody's shot in downtown Pittsburgh or in Homewood. The, the, the only way it matters at that point in time is, well, if they're shot in downtown Pittsburgh, it's an inconvenience to some in the population. Mm -hmm. If they can just keep it in certain pockets right. of the city, we'll tolerate it that way. That's not going after the rudimentary issue. And as a matter of fact, that's been the approach that you have seen 
for Absolutely. two, three, four decades when it comes to issues in the African American community. Well, if we can just, you know, make sure it's in the Hill District and now no longer just in the Hill, we just got to keep it out of the lower hill away from Consul. And if we can keep it in Homewood, keep it away from East Liberty where the target is. And Hazelwood, well, not too many people think about Hazelwood and only certain parts of the north side. If we can tolerate and, you know, centralize it there, we'll be okay. That's not resolving the issue. That's pushing around poverty and then it's calling it something much greater. I think that's a, it's, it's malfeasance, and it's, it's very, very egregious to continuously put people in office that think that that's, solo, that's resolving an issue. That's not a solution. That's running away from the problem. Ms. Bradford? I, I, I do say I do agree, I do agree okay. <clears throat> with that because it is. It's in pockets. It's, okay, they're shooting there. Well, we're not worried about that. They always do that there. So as long as it doesn't come over here to our neighborhood, there isn't a concern. But as, as things change, as you can see now, East Liberty, we're not having all those, that stuff in East Liberty anymore. Well, we got more police over there. That's a whole other issue. That's a, you know, about. we, got, we have don't all have that. We have time so, show to talk right, about that. So I think he's absolutely correct. We need to look at the 23% at unemployment rate. That would be an emergency if it was white America, okay? It would be an emergency. Oh my God, 23% unemployment? What are we gonna do? You know what, what it would be called? What? It would be called the Great Depression because that's exactly what the unemployment rate was See? in the 1930s. But now it's just us. Great so. comment. Nick, uh, do we have another call? Caller, you're on the air. Caller's gone. Mm -hmm. um, very good. Now, okay, we talked about the presidential <laughs> election. We got Congress election. And just for, you know, um, be fair, so Mike Doyle is a Democratic yes, yes. candidate running for Congress. Yes. You're a Republican. Now, we have a senatorial race going on as well. Now, there's two... Um, U.S. Senators in uh, Pennsylvania and in every state. So right now we have Katie McGinty who's running as a Democrat against Toomey who is the incumbent Republican candidate. What are your thoughts on the matter, uh, Ms. Bradford? Well, we've seen what Mike Toomey has done. Uh, he has voted down everything the president wanted to try to do. I mean, he has shown he has been a true Republican. He hasn't gone against it. Um, some things he has gone with the president. I think it was with the guns, uh, some of those that he did for a minute. But I think it, he is one of those, the business as usual, that has been there that has, I, I couldn't tell you what he's done for the state of Pennsylvania. I don't know if, I don't know where, I don't remember him coming to our neighborhoods. I don't remember him addressing anything going on with um, the issues that are going on in, 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 you know, all communities that are struggling. So I, I don't see any concern um, for anyone that's not a one percenter for him. I just don't think he really cares. Okay. Mr. McAllister? Well, I think that he's worked with um, Senator Joe Manchin down in West Virginia on the gun issue. I think that he's also been involved with making sure that sexual predators are not able to find loopholes in our background checks and make sure that they're working in our schools. He was very much on the forefront of that and, and generally speaking amongst the 100 in the U.S. Senate, Pat Toomey is seen as more of being a moderate. He gets beaten up in the middle part of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. for working with the Democrats a little bit too much. I think that, um, that he, he is not as as far to the right as some, you start looking at a place like Texas where you can be further to the right. Mm -hmm. You look at a, at a Pat Toomey, somebody that has worked with Manchin and others, he seems to have more of a reputation of being in the middle. Uh, when it comes to Ms. McGinty, you know, we all know that she worked for Governor Wolf for a second. She ran for the governor's race herself in 2014 and, and yes. failed in, in the primary. You know, there are some things that are troubling in regards to her record, some of the things that she stands for, including standing for the Iranian nuclear deal that was signed last year, where we have given billions of dollars over to the Iranians just for them to continue to threaten Israel, which they have done, to continue to test ballistic, ballistic missiles, which they have done, and to continue to work with now the Russians in regards to mm -hmm. some of the things that we're seeing in Syria. And so there's, it's, it's serving to destabilize the Middle East, and that's a policy that she'd wow. be looking to put into place as well as you know her positions on sanctuary cities, which is highly controversial because you're starting to talk about undocumented individuals taking jobs when the unemployment rates in both Philadelphia and Pittsburgh are extremely so high. So, Ms. McCaus, you said a lot. You said a lot, Ms. Bradford. I don't, I don't, I don't you look like the, you want to say. I don't something. think the undocumented immigrants have anything to do. They'll, the unemployment for African Americans will still be low whether they're here or not. So, the the the, the, the reason of undocumented is not it. The reason why they're here, a lot of them, first of all, they wanted to get here, and companies hired them. Okay, those big companies hire these undocumented because they'll do a job cheaply. We need to find them for hiring. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But to say that the undocumented is a reason why African American, we don't have that many here. What's, what's, what's our story here? There, it has nothing to do. It's not the do. same as in Philadelphia and it's not the same in Hazleton. And, and I can tell you that being in other parts of the country as well, people think that undocumented workers 
are people that are not smart, that's not true, and people that will only do very menial jobs, and that's not true either. No. People will come, for example, and you can't, you know, first of all, saying that if you're an undocumented person coming to America, you can't say you're the greatest nation on the face of the earth and then say you don't want people coming here. So it's not their fault that they're trying to come here. It's Absolutely. the fact that they're coming here in an illegal fashion. Okay, and, when, and, and when you're talking okay. about, very quickly, I'm sorry, when okay. you're talking about construction jobs, those are jobs that African Americans are sitting on the sideline for that you will see on documented people. Do you people see it work. here in Pittsburgh? You do see it here in you Pittsburgh. It's got nothing to do with the and documented workers. It has nothing to do with them. And this is a very nothing to interesting do with issue. We're going to change up again because we have 10 minutes left and I want to get through some more issues. <laughs> okay. We have another Congress. I know, guys, this is exciting, but we're going to get through it because we're going to educate our audience. We are. We're debating, but we're going to educate. So I want to talk a little bit about the other congressional race in our area, that one uh, with Aaron McClellan, who is running as a Democrat, and we've got Keith Rothfuss running as Republican. Any thoughts on that, Mr. McCaster? Well, I have had an opportunity to talk to uh, Congressman Rothfuss in regards to some of the things that I would like to put in place, and I think that that's where I can serve as an asset into this region, to be able to talk to people that have been in Congress for a couple of years now. The Republicans still control the House of Representatives. Right now they can serve, they control the Senate, and it's more likely that they'll control the House more than they will control the Senate, but we'll see in November to be able to talk to a key for office, to be able to talk to a Congressman Murphy and say these are things that between the three of us representing the Pittsburgh region can be done to help the disadvantaged. I, I know that I um, will be able to work with Congressman Roffice and get stuff done. I don't know Ms. McClellan very well, but I can say that I have spoken to, to Congressman Roffice on several occasions and looking forward as to what we can get done to help people get back on track here in Southwestern PA. Ms. Crawford, your thoughts? Um, since he's been around for a while, he knows what's going on here. He has not made any effort to make any changes to help to, or to even address that he recognizes we have some issues going on in these areas at all. So it's like oblivious. Uh, those are not the people they brought to put a man and he could care less. So I, my feeling is we, we really don't. I mean, I understand you could talk to them, but that doesn't mean they're going to change their minds. It doesn't mean they're going to work with you because they haven't worked this far. They, they see all the data, they have all the information, they know what they are, where, where we're struggling, and I haven't seen any changes in their thinking or anything they have done to make me believe that they even are trying to reach out. There has been no reach out at all. So I don't know how. I can tell you how, very briefly, it's about showing the mutual benefits. Republicans say that they want government spending to go down, right? Well. If you want government spending to go down, you need more taxpayers into the process. How do you get more taxpayers into the system? You get them working. You get them paying taxes. You get them buying homes. You get them buying cars. Right. If you make them bigger, stronger, more stable consumers, you can get the government spending down because less people are relying on the government. You can get your tax revenues up and you can lower the deficit. That is what they care about. So if I go in there caring about the community and I can show them mutual benefits in regards to getting those things done, that's a win. That's not happening right now. So maybe they don't represent Homewood or they don't represent Wilkinsburg, they don't represent Swissville, but they do want to see the deficit go down. They do want to see government spending go down. So there's a way to bring mutual benefits right. to the table so that we can both win and people as a result can win as well. Okay, I want to talk about one more issue sure. briefly and then I'm going to have, ask for some closing remarks if you have any. Uh, and I have a couple of things to say. Um, of course you're the host. The, thank you, <laughs> I know, but with you guys, sorry. Right. Okay, so, but it's fun. Um, violence, a perceived, uh, violence against African Americans by the police. And I'm gonna let Ms. Bradford go first. You got about a minute. Um, what do you think? Is that something more so like the Democratic Party would advocate against or for or the Republican Party? I mean, is that a political issue or is that just a police issue? I think it's both. I think uh, it's been, I mean, it's been used as a political issue and it should be because we're talking about people dying, sometimes dying for no reason, um, and we should be all appalled at it, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, this is a person. Uh, sometimes we care more about dogs. Uh, we watched our police Rocco. show up traffic when we buried this dog, backed up traffic all over Pittsburgh, cost how much money for all the police to be off of duty when there were shootings in Homewood probably, they were nowhere to be found. So I think the issue of of African Americans or anybody that gets killed should be. We need our police, we respect our police, but we do not, we need this, this needs to be a conversation, always race never. 
Nobody wants to have that conversation mm -hmm. about race. But we have got to have that conversation because what's going on can't continue. We, the problem is going to get worse before it gets better if it's not addressed by all, everyone on both sides. I mean, it has to be community-based. It has to be, community has to be involved with the police. We, they've got to work together because we need the police in, in those inner city communities that, that, are, that are having those issues. But we need them to, to, to be able to be somebody that we are not afraid of, that we can trust when we call them, that they're not gonna now, which I've been hearing recently, shoot the person who's calling the police. Right. Thank you, Ms. Bradford. Mr. So, McAllister? I think it's something that, um, again, it can be resolved. I think that a lot of people think that we're going down the wrong path, that it's not capable of being resolved, but the truth is we want police to police the communities. We don't want them being social, sociologists with guns. And right now, we have overtaxed the police. We have overtaxed our, our teachers. We have overtaxed the few mentors that we have in our communities. If we're able to get back into the mix, and like I said, go after the rudimentary issues of what's affecting these communities and affecting these children that have been traumatized almost since birth, oh my God. and then you're telling them at 15, 16, 17, learn how to act, mm -hmm. well, they've been going through trauma their whole life. Mm -hmm. If we start going after the rudimentary issues, we can rebuild the partnerships between police and community members, and we can make a better Pittsburgh. I, I, I want to be on the vanguard of that. I look forward to being on the vanguard of that. And in one minute or less, Ms. Bradford, do you have any close remarks that you'd like to give to our audience that may help them with their education? Absolutely. I think education is the key, and we, we see that our state keeps cutting the budgets they have across the country. I think that's, in, I don't think that's unintentional. I think it's intentional. I think they really don't want people really to be that educated. And, and thank you, Ms. Bradford. I'm sorry, we only have about, one, about 30 <laughs> seconds for you, Mr. McAllister. Um, well, all I want to say is that after a quarter of a century, we have an opportunity to finally get better. We have an opportunity to have somebody that's been one of us to represent us in Washington, D.C. and start fighting for the resources and the respect that we just haven't had in this region for far too long. So I'm looking for you all to go to my website, lennyforcongress.us. I'm looking for your vote, I'm looking for your prayers, I'm looking to work forward with you together as one big team. I want to thank our guests, they were <laughs> fabulous. And also I do want to mention that, you know, people in the community are imperative. I wanted to mention that there's an event with OWN, the 25th, an uh, 25th anniversary on September 17th. And um, I think it's important that community groups that are doing things to educate and OWN does educate need to be recognized. And I also wanted to be clear, you know, we have to get involved. We have to ask questions. We have to hold our leaders accountable. And we, we can have justice. If we are apathetic, do not vote, and not support each other, then we will always wonder why things don't make sense. You gotta be proactive, not Absolutely. just reactive. Absolutely. And I think that's something that both my guests here today would agree upon. Yes. And bipartisanship, I hope that's a word that our can audience can mm -hmm. learn and see. It's not just about my way and your way, it's about working together to make things better in the community for us all. So with that said, I want to thank you both for being a guest thank on you this for uh, edition of Politicians Live. We haven't had a show in over a year, and I think this was really important due to the presidential election and all the other elections going on. on. So without the people voting and being a part of the process, there won't be a process. Sure so it's inevitable that we can actually all make a difference, and we can do it. We can. Yes, Get the can. phone yeah, numbers of your leaders. Call them. Call them. When there's a petition, sign it. We can make things happen, and you have to vote. If you're Bernie or Bus, think about it. <laughs> right. You got to vote. It's very important. We all can make a difference. And again, I want to thank PCTV for having us here today. Thank you so much. And our producer, my producer, Flo Taylor, for making sure that she provides this information so that we continually educate our community. Um, without the education, there's nothing that we can do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Thank I you think it was a really us. good show. Yes. I really yes. enjoyed it. And I think that our audience learned. And I think our callers really gave us some good comments today. Absolutely. And um, hopefully that will continue. This dialogue will continue. And, and I think I'd Has like to, to see both of you guys again. <laughs> yeah, we'll be back. Definitely.